वेलकम व्यूअर्स एंड वेलकम स्मिथ वी आर डिलाइटेड टू हैव यू गेस्ट फॉर आवर पॉडकास्ट एक्सिट दिस पॉडकास्ट इज प्रोड्यूस बाय सेंटर फॉर एक्सेलेंस इन एंटरप्रेन्योरशिप एंड डेवलपमेंट एट गोखले इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स एंड इकोनॉमिक्स पुणे सेंटर फॉर एक्सेलेंस इन एंटरप्रेन्योरशिप एंड डेवलपमेंट और सीड एज वी कॉल इट इज रिसर्च पॉलिसी एंड एडवोकेसी सेंटर फॉर एंटरप्रेन्योरशिप uh seed tries to get together uh, several stakeholders academician policy makers industry market professionals and entrepreneurs and try to address several issues that uh, affect small businesses with a particular focus on uh, nano entrepreneurs yeah uh, okay welcome smith uh, yeah let me introduce uh, smith a little bit he is a friend so i think uh, it's uh, like kind of added pleasure for me to talk to him today uh, smith is an engineer who later on moved to economics uh, he did masters in economics and currently he is director data and research at good business lab smith will start talking little bit about what you are currently doing it at uh, good business lab yeah so hi um, pleasure to be here i mean gokhale is like place where i come often so glad to be here in this new studio uh, so i'll just try to briefly explain about good business lab or gbl as we try to say uh, gbl is kind of a not for profit it's labor innovation lab and it kind of mixes two things which is like business and research so i think it comes from kind of the founders itself so two of the founders are arch advaryo and anand naishtham so arch is currently at ucsd and anand is at university of michigan and both are kind of their uh, in their business school as a faculty of uh, as economist so they bring in lot of academics uh, research rigor to it and the third co-founder is anand ahuja he is kind of heads the organizational development at shai export which i think will come more often again uh, and then what they have started doing is uh, shai export is largest garment exporter in, in india they employ more than 100000 workers and a lot of them in garment sector are women and that's why gender becomes a natural focus for us as well right so what started as independent academicians working with a business together uh, to kind of extend worker wellbeing policies and like research on worker wellbeing policies in 2012 that kind of got formalized in 2017 as good business lab right so the kind of motto or the kind of tag line that we have is worker well being is good business and what we mean is that a um, lot of businesses especially blue collar businesses under invest in their workers uh, especially in their worker well being and what we are trying to do by kind of rigorous research programs we are trying to do is to kind of show that if businesses invest in workers uh, that will help workers but that will help businesses themselves right and that's why it comes to kind of doing causal research many times rct is to show if you do something for workers um, then what are your benefits in terms of your productivity attrition absenteeism of workers other things right so that's the kind of flavor for what we do and that's lot of program so we started as i said with chai export now we are working with gig economy automobile sector in india along msmes are kind of portfolio has increased from garment to automobile fast food we are kind of now have become a global organization with lot of projects in latin america us and india right can you elaborate more mainly for the benefit of our viewers like mm. the work with uh, with a help of an example or mm. perhaps something that's you are working on or something that you did and you are quite you quite liked it what you did there so i'll i'll start from as i say from the beginning right so i can explain why the we why we do the work we we do right so um the first one of the first evaluation that this trio co-founders did was kind of evaluation of soft skill program for female garment workers called pace by gap so as uh, shahi exports is a export house the what it means is global brands like gap will essentially provide them with orders and shahi exports will manufacture it right the contract manufacturing supply chain and what happens in supply chain is lot of times 
uh, brands would kind of make their suppliers do certain programs uh, for CSR, well-being, brand mandate, all of it, right? So what the program was to see now, soft skills are not something you will expect in a garment manufacturing, especially for workers, right? Like, so a lot of people might assume these are skills which are more uh, attuned to say managerial level or even for like uh, knowledge workers, right? But what we wanted to see is how does this impact women as well as how does it impact businesses, right? Because um, in business manufacturing, every minute is time is money, literally money, right? Like the, the time a worker is not on shop floor, that is costing firm in terms of production, right? So there is a lot of time firms have to invest to kind of give this training to the workers, right? So how does this, how do you evaluate this, right? So um, the main thing, like the classic idea is, okay, in one factory, you do this training, in the other factory, you don't do this training and then compare the outcome. That's like a very often first response that comes up. The problem is factories in themselves have different management. Uh, they undergo a lot of fluctuation, right? So if you want to say how productivity of factory change, there are multitudes of factors that can affect that, right? So the way we are trying to kind of tease out the causal impact of the program is to do a randomized control trial. And I can talk about this particular program, right? So what we did first was, so in few factories we wanted to. So first we said, who are the people who are interested to take up this program, right? So we kind of elicited say 3000 people who were interested and then randomly assigned half of the people uh, saying that, hey, you will get this training for this six month, rest of the people will come in next batch. Now, the advantage this gives us is that when you have, this was across multiple factories, so uh, everything else between these two groups are same, right? Like all of these are interested candidates. Right. Um, all of them are like very statistically, then they'll be, because we're randomizing, they'll be similar across everything, yes. right? So then once these people get training, uh, you can actually see the impact, right? So what we found was the people absenteeism was less in these people, they are treated less as well as the productivity is higher. And we just, I mean, usually when economists do RCTs, there are much more because we are not interested in so this program worked or not. We are also interested in why it worked, like what we'll call as mechanisms, right? So the mechanisms, what we're saying is like uh, communication was very important, right? So just give you some examples. A uh, lot of times uh, workers remain absent uh, and absenteeism is an issue, but a lot of time workers remain absent because without giving their managers notice, right? Or officially going. Or if their machine breaks, they take, if they know that machine is going to be broken because they're working on it, they hesitate to tell their managers, right? And all of this cost because a worker who is not present, which you, the manager didn't know, then on the entire assembly line is dependent on previous worker, right? So work, manager has to manage this, right? And any shock which is not anticipated, takes time to plan, organize, right? right? So once the soft skills had given confidence to women workers where they can tell their manager, oh, this is not right. Uh, this machine might have an issue. The more confidence they had, uh, the more they can talk with each other, communicate their issues better, that increased productivity, right? So some of these channels, we work with some of the largest, like on the other extreme. So a garment is very like labor intensive industry, right? We worked in a, one of the largest, manufacturer in Southeast Asia, where they had done a soft skill program and communication was a key even in that case, right? So this, some of the things that we are seeing in garment sector, we see repeated across industries and not just like garment, which is kind of lower end of value added, but like even higher end of value added, right? So I think some of these is why we need our cities where we can ease, like practically tell firms what is your return on investment on these right. firms, right? And that is one of the things that we, are trying to show rigorously and that's why our cities were not all our experiments are artists sometimes we use many other forms but our city is the many many times cleanest way to test some of these right yes so uh, if i understand correctly is it like a kind of core premise of the work is this will be like these initiatives will be good for businesses as well as good for workers 
yeah so that's the core premise right it's like, like a win win scenario or like in economics what sometimes we say the pareto improvement or something like it so just a question why businesses didn't see it before like they should be doing activities like this yeah so i think there are multiple factors here right so i think uh, somebody who has ever been a manager of large team would know that bandwidth is a big concern right so it so sometimes businesses don't have bandwidth to think about it so i think it becomes easier and easier as your size grows right where for example shai exports where we work is a large firm so they have a team called as organizational development where there is a specific team that can focus on some of this so there are people who are dedicatedly think about it so they can do some of this training in house but if you think about a smaller one size firm they might not have bandwidth or like right. enough scale to have a fixed asset who can take things that's what right sometimes uh, these links are not apparent because businesses there are so many things changing things are not apparent right so that's why some of these things might take time for businesses to know some of these might be frontier of technology for example businesses might not think soft skills are important right and given that there are so many different pieces that they are juggling with they might not have dedicated bandwidth to do it or sometimes even some people are like hey i want to do this but market might not exist where like if i want to do a soft skill training for workers there might not be market tailored specifically for my industry or my workers my demographic of my workers so some of these things might affect these things kind of exacerbate in developing countries where the markets are thin information is scant or like there is not enough skilled managerial capacity as well right so i think it's mixture of all of this but i would say bandwidth becomes major issue capital and access become issue and thin markets of lack of availability of vendor to provide what you require can also be things and then there is also a screening question because in developing countries you might not have a clear uh, kind of signal of quality where you want to do soft skill training but there are so many bad trainers who provide soft skill training that you are not able to find the right thing where now you are not able to find who is the right provider and then because you see 10 people eight of them are not great then you might judge the average quality which might be sub optimal for you to invest so multiple of these things require businesses to not and some of these are kind of things that should have been taken care of public sector right for example some of these are great if people great in their education level right so for example some of the things that skilling is one thing lot of people talk about and it could be great if there is a central scheme of providing this training of soft skills so before they join they have this acquired skills, right? that particular but then set of skills. like sometimes if they don't have this then firm have to step in because the cost of that uh, their gains from like that training might over might be more than the cost of that training but ideally in many developed countries people might already have the stock of skills because their education system might be better right so there is an argument for policy makers to actually address this concern before like this issue begins inside the firm yeah obviously right so ideally firms don't have to do that firms so technically speaking like in skilling literature why firms like thinking technically firms wouldn't want to invest in you because a there are two types of skills right one is transferable skills one is firm specific skills firms would ideally be only invested in firm specific skills versus transferable skills because i give you transferable skills your marginal productivity increases and then you might want to either hire a compensation for right. that or leave for higher compensation yeah. so i don't get benefit out of it correct but that is the case in perfect market which we all know doesn't exist right, right. but as a theoretical case of why firms wouldn't want to do it and we see a lot of times where like for example in manufacturing sector lot of workers are contractual when firms know these workers are not going to stay with more than 6 months they are unwilling to invest in these workers right right so yeah i mean sir uh, are the lessons that you have learned are kind of uh, specific to textile firms or applicable to firms uh, across different sectors i think some of the lessons are specific and some of the lessons are very generalizable right like for example we are working at two extremes now so one extreme we are working with a uh, essentially garment agency which is uh, say characterized by low productivity low margins low technology labor intensive 
very high number of women you right. know for spartan and other extreme we were working with automobile sector which right. is completely which is capital intensive uh, forefront of technology and very few women and some of the issues we see are similar uh, but some of the issues are completely different right for example it is not difficult to get women to work in uh, garment industry uh, versus it's hard to get women in automobile industry because there is like critical mass that you need multiple other factors but uh, if you go a step further the issues of how many women rise up and what are the fraction of women in the things it's the same issue even if there are fewer women here even in white collar jobs in automobile you see same struggles across women advancing and those lessons which we learn are very transferable to other sectors right right because automobile sector is known for some sort of uh, what we say fraught labor relations right like india has little bit of recent history of yeah. such events and yeah it will be interesting to see how the some of the lessons kind of uh, go there let me uh, get to the more gender dimension of it and in fact ask question that perhaps might be beyond what you are currently doing that's about labor force participation right like that has been a topic that's discussed perhaps decade or more right in india and there are lots sorts of puzzles and answers we end up uh, hearing about it what's uh, your take on situation and solutions well it's a yeah i I'll, i'll try to explain what i understand and then so i think uh, some of the things that uh, you see there are like big tides that change right like so for example the classic examples are for example women labor force participation in us change after second world war right like it was such a big shock it changed like a lot of men had to go to war uh industrial output in the us increased a lot because the war demanded a lot of it right. so a lot of women were forced into labor force and that essentially kind of change how many women went to work so i think there are bigger factors uh in india i think it's a very like i think no podcast on gender is complete by, without saying this line of like uh, in, we have the lowest female labor force participation uh, participation sans like uh, middle east and then it has been decreasing now i think post pandemic the plfs data shows it has increased but there is a lot of debate over why yes. it has increased is good or not right but i do think like some of the core learnings are that uh, at least for me have been uh, this is linked to india's employment the type of employment we have and globally this has been like changes in how uh, industry works and what is the demand for labor and that kind of has pulled women into industries and that in turns has like had cascading effect of norms number of women etc right so i do think some of the central tenet has to be like are there enough demand for uh, job, uh for labor right. like that's central and then how much usually you end up having men fill up those first women later because of gender norms other stuff but that's first and then how many equitable that is so these two things starts playing a part and then there is supply side issue of norms uh, like care work child care all of that starts acting up as a entire ecosystem that kind of puts you lower so it might just be a multiple equilibrium setting where is set at low and we need a big push to kind of get to a better equilibrium so to speak right right means if you look at plfs like for indian women there is a kind of an interesting observation that own account working it's mm-hmm. a very big factor for them in fact like globally perhaps it will be one of the largest like share right like mm-hmm. uh, so uh, it, it typically means they take up some piece work and something and they are able to uh, do that and get paid in return right like everything is that like a better thing than they not working at all or should we see it as a worse thing than they are employed in the more fuller potential act i think i mean i i i would presume that working is better than not working because i think economic uh, so around kind of if you use a nebulous style of empowerment or like uh, women economic power i think having financial freedom or ability to command resources right has repercussion on lived life right women men as well so as women earn more it increases their ability to control some aspects of their life more right and that's the central tenet of why people are interested because it goes to equality gender justice kind of things right 
uh, I mean, I'm not saying it will solve all the problems, but it is a important piece to kind of go right. there, right? So I think women working on kind of, as you will call them, nano entrepreneurs, self-employed is important piece. But a lot of these is kind of stopgap solution because they're doing it because they have to. Right. It's not what they would ideally want. Like not some of them would want, but it's not ideal. So I think it will still be better for get them formal employment, which is very few. Like it's I think 12 or 14 percent is formal employment in India. Right. So I think the reason why it's important is it gives you much more structure and as well as social protection. Right. Like uh, self-employment is plagued with uh, fluctuations right. and shocks. Right. Uh, and risk while employment can give much more security and that's kind of very important to kind of get a f like kind of steady flow of income as well right so that's why it's ideal to have much more of formal employment but it also depends on how your economy is structured yes exactly and like some of the bigger factors like uh, culture or norms like mm -hmm. Do we expect them to kind of change uh, on their own with the like flow of time or are there some system systematic efforts to address some of the influence they generate on individuals means uh, either in your study or like in your own research like anything that has. So we are trying to study some of this but I honestly think that in the long term this I think if you have change economic situation, these norms will adjust. They will affect how fast or slow it is, but usually they have, like we are seeing global, right? Like an exciting example of US, gender norms have tremendously changed over the last 100 years, right? Like uh, for having laws that forbade women from working if their husband had jobs, hmm. from that to getting much more things where we are just talking about uh, gender gap in wage gap, which is very, huge improvement over 100 years. So those historically you see across countries, those have changed. Uh, so I agree with you that it will change. Now, what is the pace of that change? And it's not given that it should change, right? right. Like exactly. those countries where economics have changed, they have changed, but even the in type of industry's growth is not given, right? So I think uh, the speed at which it adjusts will also determine, right? So I think there are kind of multiple things, right? One of the studies I want to cite is a study in Saudi Arabia where, for example, uh, it's around social norms, which is essentially impliciting understanding of what things. And uh, it's simple, right? Like, so the study looked at, okay, what do men think about? What is the acceptance of in the society of women working? So what is like, I'm an individual A, what is my belief that other people around me think about women. So I personally think it's okay for women to go to work, right. but I think that other men around me don't think it's okay for women to work. And it might be th that everyone believes that society thinks, but privately everybody thinks that it's right. okay. But we don't know each other, right? So the study was simple where what they did was they changed this belief of like telling men, okay, we did a survey and X percentage of men in your society thinks it's okay for women to work. Just changing that belief where I'm like, oh, there are other people who think like me have essentially changed how wives of these men apply to job. So some of this can change quickly. Right, and right. there's other example, right? Like, for example, gay rights in the UK where it's like in a decade's time, it completely changed, right? So I think these things can change. Obviously, it's hard for people to predict the change, right? right. right? So you can't predict the change, but change can happen very fast, right? right. Uh, economic situation. So I think in India... Uh, we are doing a couple of experiments, right? So, for example, we are trying to see the this literature that shows it's hard for women to cross boundary of their village for employment, right? So, what we are trying to do here is to, the experiment we are trying to do is provide employment to women where women go to a workshop, some of the participants go to workshop, work there, while some of the women can work from home. Right. And we are trying to test out, like, how does it affect care? How does it affect uh, their uh, essentially childcare responsibility, other responsibility, household? So I think it's workshop located in the village, uh, near to the village. Okay, not all village will have, but right. near where they can travel easily, right? And the interesting thing is, we did a pilot in Jharkhand, like okay. rural area of Jharkhand, and the our prior is like social norm will prevent women, but 
none of the household objected because the situation in there it's a tribal area is so abject and the poverty level so high that like any employment opportunity the benefit was so high that people overcame all other barrier and all women work now so that's so that tells us that like that's not thing but it is dependent on situation now we are doing it in rajasthan right where different cultural different context. cultural context and there we will try to learn this more yeah. so this study is yeah. on the trial so i think uh, demand size where we are working automobile to having more women and that's where i think labor demand is going to be something which is going to be central to changing i think there are structural factor right so lot of women who came out to work there were less resistance if could they did, they could do their household chores on top of their jobs right. but once you start asking substitution where other people take care or children go to take care that's where the frictions become between family and uh, yeah so the, they are non linear right like if you have to go back go and work for 3 4 hours the frictions would be less but then they won't scale like if you go to 8 hour every day then the friction might go more right so that's some of the things where we are trying to see how those play out right. but it's uh, difficult to say because care work uh, is a very important factor around that plays into like i think uh, child care about maternity and then care work about elderly household chores gender norms about who is supposed to do household chores it's the time you survey clearly shows indian men, like women spend disproportionately large time compared to men doing household chores and care work and compared to even globally we are very skewed right yeah another sort of global uh, interesting evidence means i am now taking the direction slightly towards what we like to understand here is about the entrepreneurship right like generally across the world it is seen that when it comes to entrepreneurship women have much lesser proportion of entrepreneurs compared to men in general it's 2 to 5% means out of all men in the workforce in that country 2 to 5% will be employers entrepreneurs for women that percentage is generally lower what do you think kind of explains that is it like a some sort of structural risk attitude according to gender or is it like still an uneven sort of field that we offer to these two genders i think it's true what you're saying right like, and it's true in every sector and that's true in entrepreneurship entrepreneurship is even more because i think uh, the mobility restriction that women have compared to men uh, the access to credit that women have compared to men as well as social capital that men have and obviously other thing becomes control of the resources that you have so all of things are very disproportionate and it's embedded the how our social structures are so that makes it harder for women to become entrepreneur and it's similar to other part of like uh, wage earning potential right so i think that is same learning here those things right there are other things that have kind of so self help groups have been one right. which have been trying to promote women entrepreneurship giving support and the idea is same right like a uh, financial freedom will give us freedom like start percolating in other aspects of life right, right. so i think uh, those things are there access to credit has been one of the biggest factor but who controls so there have been experiments which kind of shows that uh, if you give women credit uh, how much of they can use for themselves versus family can then access to this is right, things, right? like yeah. so essentially who has access to resources within households can percolate where the expansion of business reinvestment in business becomes slightly tricky for women some of that profit might go into households for men it might go into back into business right? so some of those aspects come into picture uh, for women so i i honestly think that uh, some of the facilities need to kind of take that into account design sensitive because it's a tricky thing right so some of the optimal strategies might be different in short term versus long term because there are results which shows that having men and women together might be more beneficial compared to just giving finance to women right because there might be retribution of that there is something called as breadwinner norm where women don't want to earn more so they will want to earn 45% of the household rather than cross the 50% barrier because then you kind of have more money and that has a backlash Right. so some of those aspects start coming in that's why the policy making becomes slightly nuanced and tricky in these things but i honestly think 
women entrepreneurship uh, has similar issues but they are more accentuated because uh, in jobs women have to go to work and there are others who can take care of the other things but in entrepreneurial things they have to have the agency to take all these decisions and if they have lower of like mobility access to credit all of these things there is also a literature from behavioral economics uh, which talks about uh, risk appetite like and then you see that lot of new evidence that emerges it's also social country where, where women have we are more risk averse compared to yeah. men and that might be led to other like factors but it might be evolutionary of, legacy right the way or so the, for example there is a very interesting study uh, that was done in northeast india uh, which kind of looks at like that is one of the few places where you see matriarchal as well as patriarchal societies and they right. are very close and if you see the risk preference of uh, women in matriarchal society those mimic men in patriarchal society uh, much more right so you can see some of these might be societal conditioning right. or like rules roles that you have played in the right, past right. might be different right so it's difficult to kind of disentangle both but i do think like uh, situations or providing right policy conditions might help to alleviate some of it and the main thing is like uh, and in india right specifically in india um, we are so far away from forefront right like our labor force rate is 30% right so uh, some of the issues that affect at that labor force are very different that's affecting us at when the labor force they are talking about like 17 18% wage gap which is true which is important but for us there's large distance to traverse and the problem might be very different at each stage that people are right 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 so maybe in a kind of a small sort of uh, like maybe like india there might be a small pool of uh, certain sort of sections where the gender norms have kind of now much less restrictive and there we might perhaps see a sort of greater uh, sort of or more level sort of uh, field emerging right that's possible if we can track such things through data means i don't know it's it's just a difficult question right so one of the thing about labor force participation actually if you look at that angle uh, women who have lower income or come from lower social income they have much higher uh, labor force participation that the women, inverted u sort of thing we talk about yeah but or I even the downward like, so slope. india i don't think it's you right like it's a downward sloping yeah, yeah. curve right so you don't know like what place there are multiple factors which we can go into but i do think that there is like a we have to kind of shift the entire curve curve upwards in some sense right like and the problems might be different like problem in it sectors might be very different in garment sectors right so i think it is there for us to solve and like country as diverse in in india i think there are multiple problems at the same time and you have to see which is the as a policy response you have to see which is the biggest problem you have to solve and some problem like you get industry to solve right like by policy is something government acts to solve this policy right so i think uh, like everything else in india you need all hands on the deck to solve some of this bigger issue and i do think employment is the the biggest issue that we have right yes, now yes yes and there has been like quite a bit of action from government and non government fronts means something that i have observed in uh, like northern uh, states right like there is some sort of uh, focus on women entrepreneurship and small entrepreneurship uh, means in general we there is nothing that we should be feeling negative about it but uh, sometimes when i think closely about them i sometimes believe that it might lead to some sort of inefficiencies or some sort of uh, effects that we have not foreseen for example women entrepreneurs are simply like a front essentially for family controlled or main controlled entrepreneurship like as you said for sag participation right that it is not led to the agency or perhaps proliferation of many small activities is not a very efficient uh, situation in that particular uh, sort of scenario means uh, what's the take on entrepreneurship in general as a route to labor force participation i think so there are two aspects right so why are we interested in this right so i think there are two aspects as a, every country is interested in entrepreneurs the reason is they create jobs 
right but here entrepreneurship is equated to jobs right which is slightly different uh, things right like so compared to all others entrepreneurship require different skills compared to wage employment right, right? and it is difficult to assume like at least for me that everyone can be a good entrepreneur right so ideal situation is that uh, you get you kind of provide resources to good entrepreneurs so that they can grow their businesses right. and employ more people and that's better allocation what good so the 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 main benefit of this kind of SHGs is to identify who is that, right? So essentially think about this, right? Like your idea is to find good entrepreneurs and then provide them access to everything so that they can become big. Right. That's the ideal situation. The issue is currently uh, we have so fewer so that you there are people who are not getting started and hopefully these SHGs will kind of allow people to start so that the people who are great entrepreneurs can kind of come up. So the idea is not to make everyone like ideal situation would be that you give opportunity to everyone and then you start finding who are great entrepreneurs and allow them to scale. Yeah, but won't that uh, easier access at the start for many to try entrepreneurship will also bring in lot of people who are not going to be really good at that entrepreneurship yeah. and they will be utilizing the resources that could have been there for means it remains a puzzle how to profile and know who is that Agreed. good entrepreneur and i think means i don't think so we have any final sort of uh, understanding on that but like the way uh, typically we think about entrepreneurship it is like a, a process where it's always going to be large failures and very few succeeding so if you lower that failure rate by some artificial external attempts will that be a good way to find good entrepreneurs or will it be counterproductive it's a uh, so the simple answer like looking at macro information is you should let not great entrepreneurs fail faster so that resources could be used optimally otherwise economy that's suboptimal i'm thinking about welfare consequences where you have large bunch of entrepreneurs uh, and that essentially uh, translates to welfare law so it's difficult for me to say because the worry here is that this is again stemming from we not having enough jobs right right yeah and that's where it's all kind of we are trying to curtail the fall of what not providing enough employment to good employment to people yeah. and this is like a band aid that we're trying to have by giving em entrepreneurship to everyone like which is which no, i think it has both aspects one is if they don't have job they perhaps try handed entrepreneurship and also they also generate the jobs so yeah it's but like, that's like i mean you you would know better than me that most job entrepreneurship that don't employ others it's yeah, family in india that propo yeah that, the, the proportion of people who employ outside is very low it's yeah. like me and my family as yes. Yes, the yes. unit of business right so i don't think they're generative yet they're self-sustaining in some yes, ways yes. and many of them would prefer to have a like a formal job but because that is not yeah. available they kind of get to right employment. so it is very different than like a short tank ambitious entrepreneur this is very different definition of entrepreneurship and situation of entrepreneurship right, right. they're doing entrepreneurship a lot of people are doing entrepreneurship to survive rather yes. than like like scale global business right so i think it is true to kind of we want to provide support um, it again for me at least i'm not sure about what is the optimal way of doing probably giving more support to women is great because that has other benefits yeah and then i think what the system probably needs is to identify great entrepreneurs and allow them to scale i think that's the addition like instead of providing like base support for everyone those who do well starts getting more and more support so other people can still get basic support to sustain other and then who are great then get additional resources to scale their business that might become much better model than that right yeah i think it's a debate that like kind of yeah we will we can discuss quite a lot on it but yeah we will stop here it's an interesting discussion uh, so yeah, um, thank you Smith. Thanks a lot for engaging discussion. This episode and other episodes of our podcast Exit will be available on a Seed YouTube channel. Please visit the YouTube channel and stay tuned for the further exciting content. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Kiran.